No, no. Okay, I think we're good. All right, I think it's recording now. All right. Um, what else? Um, I'm going to go ahead. The next thing I'm going to do is in the chat, I'm going to go ahead and put a survey. So if at any point you need to run because uh, you have a class you have to be at or anything like that, um, that's totally fine. Um, but I'm going to put the survey in the chat so you can give us some feedback um, so we can uh, plan for next year and things like that. Um, again, have your audio on mute during the presentation. Um, uh, but if you have questions during the presentation, you can do one of two things. Uh, if you want to type it all out, you can put it in the chat. Uh, but if you prefer, or if you think it'd be easier to um, just say the question, you'll go ahead and use the raise hand feature, uh, which is near participants towards the bottom. So you, you raise your virtual hand and then I'll call on you. And uh, then you can ask your question for the speaker. She's fine with you uh, asking questions as we go. Um, and I think that's about it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker. This is Bina Parikh. Uh, this is her second time uh, presenting to our students. We really enjoyed having her last year in person and hopefully again in person someday. <laughs> but I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Bina and she'll be happy to, uh, to talk to you. Hi everyone, I'm glad to be here this afternoon. Um, as Rex said, my name is Bina Parikh. I am a uh, clinical psychologist and um, trained in the specialty for uh, child and adolescent um, psychology. My practice was a general practice um, when I was um, in practice and in private practice here in Orlando. Uh, in the last few years, I've uh, taken a little bit of a sabbatical um, stepped out to help my husband run his uh, cardiology practice and uh, wasn't so much uh, doing my practice on a full-time basis, um, but still kept my feet in the, uh, in, the, in the mix here. So I end up doing this kind of thing uh, a lot in terms of uh, talking and, and giving feedback and lectures on, on what people are experiencing. And obviously right now, this topic of uh, stress and how are we handling it and ways to manage it is probably one of the top um, things that we're all sort of interested in, in figuring out. Um, the way I like to do my presentations is, is a little bit formal in the sense that uh, I'm old fashioned. I like my PowerPoints. So I'm going to go through my PowerPoint uh, and kind of fly a little bit through um, the, the, the beginning part of it, which is a little bit of an explanation of what uh, actually um, stress is and how it all um, affects people. So I'm going to try and see if I can get my screen share going. Okay, is everyone seeing that? I think so, right Rex? Okay. Yep, I can see it just fine, thank you. Okay, good. All right, so basically, you know, what I want to do is, is talk a little bit about um, what are, what is stress? What does it look like? Where does it come from? Uh, what are some of the triggers uh, that we have uh, that will bring it on, will make it worse? And then sort of segue into what are the things that we can do uh, to manage it and, and some of the whys behind what it is that we can do. Um, but at any point, I really would love this to be a much more interactive um, kind of thing. So if at any point I start talking about something that you'd like to maybe comment about or talk about, you know, how it, it personally, um, you know, presents for you, uh, I'm happy to, uh, to open up that conversation and open up that discussion. So don't hesitate is what I'm trying to get at. Um, so what I'm going to be covering is, is things like, what does it look like? Um, you know, what are some of the, the factors, internal and external? Um, you know, what are the things that actually influence our uh, stress factors? Um, things like our own personal inner voices and our own personal expectations. Um, and that goes to our mind and body connection, right? So what we think and how we, how we think about it affects the way our body in turn um, deals with it and, and manages it. Um, finally, talking about 
you know, how do you cope with it? Because stress ultimately at the end of the day is not our enemy. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about why it's actually sort of needed for us uh, to even be there. Um, so what is stress? So stress is something as, you know, definitions go, stress is a force uh, that requires us to make an adjustment. So in other words, it, it is an external uh, or internal, as I mentioned, um, uh, set of circumstances or pressure that requires us to do something. Um, it requires some sort of a response on our, uh, on our part. Um, and when it doesn't, that's when we start to feel that much greater um, sense of exacerbated uh, anxiety, stress, uh, sleeplessness, all those other things, and I'll get to that. Um, it can be physical, mental, emotional, obviously environmental, uh, which is what's going on right now for us with COVID-19. Um, those are all the things that play uh, a role in the impact that it's having on our mental and bodily tensions. Um, so think about it, if it's, if it's causing that level of um, impact in our mind and body, the likelihood that it's actually going to be a causative factor in disease is pretty high. Uh, and that is actually shown in research um, that uh, stress can actually exacerbate disease factors, uh, disease um, status um, and, and path. Stress is everywhere, right? <laughs> right now, especially, we're experiencing it everywhere, all day, every day on the TV. Uh, even when we just walk around, we're even not for a moment not aware of the stress simply because we look around and people are um, walking around with masks. Uh, there are signs everywhere telling us to maintain our distance. Those are all anxiety provoking things. And so, right now, it's an inordinate amount of stress that we're all sort of experiencing. And so everyone experiences it, right? So it's not something that is um, solely a individual, um, it is an individual experience, but it's not specific to just one individual. It is experienced by everybody. So for example, this uh, stat up there says that 25% of 13 to 18 year olds actually have an anxiety disorder, 25%. So that's one out of four uh, teenagers actually have an anxiety disorder and 6% of them actually have what we would consider a very severe uh, form of that anxiety requiring, you know, possibly hospitalization, medications, different things like that. Um, what do they say? What do the adolescents say, you know, is their biggest um, stressors? And so for you guys that are in college, you know it. It was things like getting into a good college and being uh, financially solvent enough to be able to afford it and not stressing out your parents. Um, for, for 16, 17, 18 year olds, those are the biggest stresses that they're dealing with. So what are the types of stress, right? So there's, there's three types. There's acute, which is a recent or an anticipated stressor. Um, so for example, you have a big project due. Uh, you have an exam coming up. Um, you have a public speaking event that you have to do. So that's an acute sort of event. Um, it's an anticipated stressor where, where it's going to be short-lived. Uh, we know it's coming, um, but it's, it definitely still has an impact on us. Episodic stress now, on the other hand, uh, is stress that occurs frequently and continues to pop up, right? So college in general is an episodic stressor um, uh, and it, it is generally there for uh, a period of time. Um, we kind of know it's going to present us with a, a bit of stress and uh, so it's, it's sort of there a little bit more frequently. Type A personalities actually, regardless of whether they're in um, college or any other stressful uh, situations, type A personalities tend to experience episodic acute stress on a regular general basis because of the level of control they exert or attempt to exert on their environments, um, often leading to a sense of I'm not in control and uh, which again leads to a sense of um, anxiety and, and frustration over that. And then of course, there's the chronic stress, which is what's relentlessly wearing on you and you feel like there's no way uh, out. 
for right now, most of us are experiencing this when it comes to COVID, uh, is a chronic level of stress and it just doesn't feel like the end is near. Um, every time you turn around, you think you're doing the right things, you think you're doing the things that you need to to make this better. And every time you turn around, you know, there's another news story of something else going on. Yesterday uh, completely stressed me out. I had heard that a week ago yesterday, the country crossed the 10 million mark for positive cases. And yesterday we crossed 11 million, which means that in one week's time, we crossed uh, or tested a million people positive. Um, so which is a, a very, you know, stressful uh, indicator. And so it just sends us into a sense of, oh my gosh, what is the way out of this? It triggers in us that tendency of wanting to fight or flight, that parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems start that fight in our bodies and we are left with, do I run the heck away from this or do I stay and fight and do what I need to do? Um, when the decision is to say, I'm out of here and I'm gonna just run away, it actually tends to really just exacerbate the issues because running away doesn't really um, obviously stop or, or mitigate the, uh, the experience that you might be having. All right, so what are they? External sources, physical, environmental, um, you know, obviously we just talked about all that. Social, romantic relationships, social acceptances, uh, parental pressures. How many of you in college haven't experienced parental pressures? If I don't, if we were in person, I'm sure uh, none of you would be raising your hand. Experience uh, parental pr uh, pressure and, and, and for this age group of where you're at, this is one of the biggest stressors. Um, and of course, institutional. Right? These college years and, and these this time, actually, you're in the you're in the peak time of experiencing stress from almost every one of these areas, right? Socially, you're trying to really get into new relationships and figure that all out. Institutionally, you're in a in a college environment. You're on a campus. You're trying to deal with all the regulations, especially now, uh, schedules and the politics and the policies and everything else. Uh, that comes along with it. Um, and then as you go along, you've got even bigger things, major life uh, changes, marriages, children, divorce, all kinds of other things, right? Um, internal stressors. Lifestyle choices are a big one. Um, how much caffeine are we drinking, right? Uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, unregulated, not one of the, the biggest unregulated drug in the United States is actually caffeine. Um, it is not regulated and there is no um, recommendation for what you should and shouldn't have. There are, but it's not regulated. Um, so caffeine is just something that we all think, okay, we need it. But the damage that we're doing to ourselves, not just physically, because as my husband's a cardiologist, he has a ton of young people in their 20s that are coming to him with palpitations and short of breath and, and uh, all kinds of other experiences. And in doing the evaluation and the history, you come to find out that they're drinking one, two, five Red Bulls a day, and then coffee on top of that and barely eating you know, breakfast and lunch and maybe getting a thousand calories uh, in meals and the rest of it is all just caffeine juice. Um, the middle one is negative self-talk. And I wanna talk a little bit about that um, because that's a, that's a component that um, we don't even realize a lot of time is happening. Um, and so when I talk about negative self-talk, I also describe the notion of having gnats. And I'm sure if I were to ask you, uh, you know, what, do you guys know what an ad is? And you would say, yeah, it's that little bug that, that flies around. And, and I'd say, describe it for me. And you'd probably say something like, well, it's, it's, it's annoying and it, it, it buzzes in your face and it, it comes out of nowhere and you don't expect it. And you're thinking everything's clean on your, in your kitchen and suddenly there's a fruit fly or a gnat floating around and you're wondering where it came from. And you're uh, just when you're, sitting there comfortably, it comes and lands on your face and you're distracted and you're swatting it away, right? So in, as in reality with a gnat, in psychology, there's a, a, a different kind of a gnat called an NAT, a negative automatic thought. And this is part of that self, negative self-talk 
concept that we're talking about. A negative automatic thought is just that. It's a negative thought or a belief system that something along the lines of, um, if I don't do well on my test, uh, I am going to be a failure. Uh, I'm going to fail the class, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a negative ex uh, experience of what you may be dealing with. Um, but the A part is what is the critical part. It's automatic. You don't even realize a lot of times that that's what you're experiencing. Um, it, it comes so fast and it distracts you uh, and it takes you off of the focus that you need, just like the GNAT, the NAT, the bug that's floating around in your face. These NATs, the negative automatic thoughts, will distract you, will take you from where you need to be and force you to be focused on that anxiety, that stressor, right? And so that negative self-talk, the critical, the judgment, the blaming, uh, those kinds of things can be very destructive uh, in your ability to manage stressors. So take a, take a moment to stop and, and ask yourself, what am I thinking? Why am I thinking this? What am I thinking? I'm gonna fail my test. Why am I thinking this? Because I think I'm, I'm gonna be afraid I'm gonna fail the class. Okay, is that real? Is that a real uh, truthful statement? If I fail the test, I'm going to fail the class. Um, it might be, it might not be. Most likely it's not the case. And even if you were to fail a test, chances are you would have had other opportunities to remedy that, whether it's test corrections or uh, meeting with the professors prior to it actually coming to a full uh, you know, end where, yes, the final uh, straw is about to break, right? So that negative, uh, negative uh, automatic thought is um, very important to try and uh, get a handle on and understand what you might be experiencing. We have a question um, in the chat. I don't know if you okay. um, wanted. Oh, I don't have my chat up. Uh, let's see if I can get that back up. Yeah, the question is, uh, what is a healthy or unhealthy amount of caffeine to drink? So <laughs> you were mentioning that earlier, if you know that. Um, so the recommended uh, caffeine, I guess recommended, is actually only about two cups of coffee. Uh, and I'm not talking about like the Starbucks version of coffee. Um, actually, Starbucks, believe it or not, if you look up the, the, the Starbucks coffee, uh, has more caffeine in their Pike Place coffee than a can of Red Bull. So uh, <laughs> um, don't go around that. But I don't know the actual number, um, you know, in terms of milligrams of caffeine. But you want to definitely keep it to about two servings of caffeine a day um, and probably even drop it down to one. Um, when you start to get much higher than that, you're starting to affect yourself, not just psychologically, but physiologically as well. I hope that answered the question. Okay, uh, moving on. So interpretation of events. This kind of goes along with that line of uh, question, I mean, uh, the thought of negative self-talk, right? So how we actually are experiencing uh, the event that might be happening. We can experience something and then quote unquote know perhaps somebody else's motive and we decide we're going to uh, apply our knowledge of what we believe that motive to be and suddenly it's it's a negative interpretation of something um, rather than actually finding things out we end up making that interpretation making that judgment and it ends up creating an additional stressor um, so being aware of how you're actually interpreting uh, the situation now, now it's not to say that everything's in your head and everything's in uh, made up and, and it's just you causing yourself stress. Here, the difference between the two things, things are going to happen, right? Um, so life and the world and, and your circle of friends and your professors are all going to throw things at you. So the stress is real. How and what we choose to do with it 
is where and how we are able to control uh, the impact of that stress on us. So it's not about saying the stressor is made up, but it's really about saying how you actually decide to interact with that stressor uh, that's going to end up having uh, direction on how much ex uh, anxiety or stress you're going to feel. Um, so those two things are, are clarifiers. Um, mind trap, you know, these are some of the, the, the different types of in, uh, stressors. Uh, being rigid, um, being an, uh, a stress-prone personality, right? We talked about type A personalities. Uh, perfectionists, um, some of you are uh, older uh, students that may have families. Uh, that you're uh, supporting as well as going to school. Uh, those uh, stresses and that combination of things uh, really will create all of those things in you. So what are we looking at and what are we feeling what is, when stress comes along? You know, you might feel dizziness, headache, shaking, tremors. Uh, you might have agitated, um, uh, you know, just sense of uh, feeling agitated, um, restless. You might be feeling hyper. Um, Fatigue is the other flip side of that same coin, right? It's a heads or a tails. Uh, the coin is the same. It doesn't change the value of that coin. So in terms of physical experience of what that stress feels like, it could be any one of these things. Um, if you have a pre-existing condition, migraines, asthma, colitis, all of that can actually be exacerbated, right? With, with what we feel. Um, mentally, we might have decreased concentration, be having a hard time making um, decisions about things. We might not even find things to be as funny as we used to. Um, and so those are some of the key um, uh, things that we probably need to be aware of. Um, that am I suddenly not even allowed, allowing uh, humor and things to make me feel better. Um, and so being aware of some of these points uh, of when sort of what I call red flags of when things may be getting really bad for you um, is super important to kind of pay attention to. Emotionally, again, we talked about the irritability and the frustration, um, the apathy that you might experience and feel. Um, those are all the ways that, you know, someone might uh, express it. Fidgetiness, in college, you might see someone, you know, compulsively smoking, compulsively drinking, compulsively overeating, um, nail biting, foot tapping, you know, these are all your body's way of sending an alarm that says, of sounding an alarm that says, hey, pay attention, I'm not feeling good on the inside. And it's going to try and get that I'm not feeling good on the inside out. And that how it comes out, again, going back all the way to the physical symptoms, right? The headache, tired, I'm not sleeping. How it comes out is super important because that's, that's that alarm bell. If you don't pay attention to that alarm bell, that alarm is just going to continue to ratchet up and ratchet up and ratchet up until it says, now he or she is going to finally pay attention. You're going to finally pay attention when that alarm bell is loud enough. So the idea for all of this is to make sure that you don't get to a place that these things are screaming at you, basically, right? Um, all right, so so this is this is actually when I gave this lecture last year, I, I talked about uh, nine eleven being a an event that caused stress across the board. Um, that more, more often than not, stress is individually experienced um, by some people and not by others. So for example, an example of that is, um, you know, for if you're traveling, the days when we used to be able to travel is when uh, a plane was delayed, you'd see some people, they just roll up, hear the announcement, you know, pull their cap back over their head and they, they fall back asleep in their chair and they're fine. Others will get up and go get something to eat and they're fine. And then you have the group that's, you know, uh, marched right up to the, uh, to the stand at the gate and they're yelling and screaming about, you know, they need to be put on the next flight and they're just not having a very good stress reaction. So same experience, different 
uh, I mean, a same event, different way of experiencing it, right? So again, those are, those are an example of just a way of the, ex the stressor is there on the external side, how we interact with it and what we choose to do with it is what's going to mitigate that stress level, right? Right now, we're all in that, another example of a generally uh, stressful situation that's actually causing uh, stress for everyone in general, which is COVID. Um, so everyone's sort of experiencing stress over this and it's not anything that individuals are. Obviously, there are, there are some that, you know, don't, buy into this notion of COVID-19 and, and decide that they don't, they're not going to follow any of it and then all of it's fake. And, and I guess that's good for them. They live their life in a, in a you know, less stressful way, which again is, a, is another example of there's a stressor out on the outside and it's up to you in terms of how you're going to deal with it. Um, what is the stress pathway? Right? Stress is experienced, as you saw in my previous slides, physically, mentally, emotionally, um, behaviorally in what we do. So stress is experienced in all of our senses. How many of you probably, you know, when you're stressed and anxious, nothing tastes good. You, know, you have cravings and you know you have cravings, but nothing tastes good, nothing satisfying. Um, because our, our whole sense of um, our sensor, sensory input is all affected by the fact that uh, our alarm bells are screaming and we're uh, just experiencing this level of discomfort that our body's saying, pay attention, do something for me, right? All right, so again, I'm just gonna let you read this real quick. Um, you know, what are some of the experiences? Um, some people overeat, some people skip meals, some people get angry. Uh, some people will snap at their classmates. Uh, there's a, the last one on here, 51% of people tell someone that they're experiencing, which means 49% of people don't actually say anything, right? Half the people that are experiencing stress aren't really talking about it. Um, they're just keeping it bottled up. And um, so it's, it's super important to have conversations, even if you think that uh, well, that other person doesn't seem like they're having a whole uh, difficult time in dealing with this. Chances are they are. It's just different for them. And being able to say something opens that up. Um, again, factors influencing how we react to stress. Those inner voices, those gnats that I was talking about. Um, how many of them are there? How frequently are they flying by? Um, how intensely are they really messing up your uh, focus and your uh, attention to things? Level of control, right? So the more we feel like we are in control, the better we feel. The less we feel in control of things, the more anxious we feel. That's a, across the board. So the type A personalities, for example, feel anxiety even when they're looking like they're in pretty good control, but the type A personality says, no, I've got to be perfectly in control. And even with a majority of their life in control, they're still experiencing anxiety. Taking that out, um, in general though, if for the most part we feel like if we put our best foot forward and study as much as possible and do what we need to do in terms of our efforts, um, we have some level of control in, for example, getting a good grade in our class. Um, it's not that out of control, right? Um, COVID, for example, is something that we have little control over. Um, little, but we do have control. How? We can engage in uh, mask wearing and social distancing and, and reduce number of uh, interactions and things like that. So even something that is theoretically looks like it's something that's so out of our control. Again, being able to look at ourselves and recognize that there are factors that we ourselves, me, myself can do to help mitigate how I interact with that stressor from the external world will make a difference in terms of how I feel. I definitely feel better um, when I have the chance to uh, wear a mask and then as soon as I'm done, I come home and I wash my hands. I feel better. But those are the things that I can do to help mitigate the stress. I can't do anything about the fact that that stressor is there. I can definitely do things to mitigate it. Um, all right. So this 
graph is one of the ones that I love to use. And it talks about um, coping with stress. And, and one of the first slides that I showed you uh, on one of the slides at the bottom, it said, stress is not our enemy. So this slide shows exactly what I'm talking about. So on the, on the left-hand side, the graph shows level of performance. And down on the bottom, it says level of arousal. So the graph, if you're not able to see the video, is a bell curve, basically. And so on the uh, bottom left-hand corner, uh, it indicates that the level of arousal is too low and the level of performance, therefore, is too low. Meaning, if something doesn't really get us going, likelihood of us actually doing something about it is gonna be slim to none, right? Um, there's a, there's a drive-in movie playing, but it's raining out. Um, and yes, I would have loved to go see it, but I'm not gonna go sit in the rain uh, to watch it. So, uh, you know, I'm not all that interested in going. So chances of me actually doing something uh, to make that happen are, are some to none. So when that level of arousal, meaning how excited am I about it or how stressed am I about it, uh, is too low, my performance is too low. All right, flip all the way over to the other side. When that level of arousal is too high, guess what? The performance is also the same as if it was too low. When we are overly stressed or overwhelmed with our uh, anxiety or what we're experiencing for that situation, we become a little bit like deer in headlights. We don't know what to do, right? And so we end up saying, no, I don't, I can't do this. And you end up sliding sort of on the other side of that bell curve. And as that anxiety or stressor goes up, our performance starts to come down like this. And we end up thinking, okay, well, I'm just gonna keep going, but all that does is continues to increase that level of stress, right? What we should actually be doing is, if I can draw on this, let's see if I can, if I can find my right thing here. What we should actually do is, obviously we wanna try and function right here, right, in this, in this space, right here. But once we get to about here, uh, if I can draw that line. Uh, nope. Let's see if I can draw it again. Once we get to about here, meaning our performance has now started to go down, what we should be doing is engaging in some activities that is going to help us bring our sense of arousal down. So for example, how is this, what does this mean? And what does this look like? You're studying for a test, you're cramming, you're, you're scared, you're, you're frustrated at the amount of content that you have to do and you're thinking, okay, I've got nine hours between now and when I have to take the test and I'm just gonna go all nine hours and I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna take a break. Well, what's typically gonna happen is that after about maybe two or three hours, you're gonna start getting hungry. You're gonna try and grab something. It might even be a, a Red Bull or so, a cup of coffee to kind of say, nope, I'm gonna just you know, skip through my lunch uh, and I'm gonna eat later. What is happening is you're thinking you're going to keep pushing your way through when all you're doing is continuing to push your anxiety level higher. As that anxiety level goes higher though, what is actually happening is our performance is going down lower, right? What we wanna try and do is reset it. So we try to get to a place where this line comes back to about here, meaning we will step away for five minutes, take some deep breaths, stretch, do something physical, um, go get a bite to eat, uh, go get some fresh air, um, do something that will help reset that ar arousal level so that you're coming back to about this point again, as opposed to being over here. When you can set that arousal back to here, guess what you're going to do? You're going to rise again, right? Your performance level is actually going to go back up again, not go down, but when you can reset your arousal, 
to about this point on that graph, you have the rest of this to ride. And then when you start to come back down again, boom, you do the same thing, you reset. And so that's the mistake that a lot of kids will make, a lot of people in general will make, is they'll think, well, I just need to push my, myself through. And the more I push, the better I'll be because I, I can't afford to take a 20 minute break because I need to study those 20 minutes, right? The fact is, is that 20 minutes stepping away and taking a break actually will improve your uh, performance because you have a chance again to rise um, to ride that all the way to the top of that uh, bell curve, as opposed to just staying on the downside of the bell curve and crashing. Um, so I hope that that um, graph makes sense to everybody. All right. Um, setting limits, saying no. Um, again, this is uh, the next one is proper rest and nutrition, um, relaxation. Stepping back, right? And explore what you're doing and why uh, you're doing it. So I always love this quote, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So when you believe that that's the what you need to do, then that's how you're gonna go across uh, uh, doing it, which not may not always be the right uh, approach to something. You may need to kind of step back and say, okay, can I take a minute back and, and maybe I'm trying to hammer a screw and it's not, it's not actually working and I need to figure this out, right? Um, another strategy that you can use is, is um, to compartmentalize and set boundaries, um, setting a study schedule for yourself, for example, uh, having conversations um, and saying, okay, I'm gonna have this conversation uh, about this person or with this person uh, about this topic and, and sort of, scheduling for it, right? Um, when you are able to set that boundary, boundaries are super important in being able to contain uh, anxiety. Uh, how I, again, like to describe it, I love to use imagery and metaphor. If I were to drop someone in, most of you guys are, are from Florida, or at least know enough about Florida to know that there are lakes everywhere. So if I were to drop you in the middle of a lake and, and that you were familiar with and say, okay, you know, swim home, uh, you know, for be scared and then you'd figure out your uh, bearings and your boundary and you'd say okay I'm gonna swim this way and you start swimming to where you need to go and you get out if I were to do the same thing and but this time drop you three miles out in the middle of the ocean and say okay swim home there's no horizon there's no you can't tell where anything is boy, that's gonna be a surefire way to set in panic in a complete way. Why? Because you're missing out on boundaries. Uh, in that lake metaphor that I gave, you've got boundaries immediately around you. And so that gives you a sense of, again, control. It gives you a sense of bearing. It gives you a sense of power in being able to actually exert what you know to do to get you to where you need to be. Whereas in the, in the ocean, when there's no boundaries, there's no um, landmarks, there's no anything for you to, um, uh, to um, set yourself to, you just start swimming and you feel like you're not really making any progress. It starts to uh, debilitate you and, and undermine you. Um, watching your language, again, that goes back to your, uh, what we were talking about, the um, NATS, right? Internal uh, scripts, um, those negative automatic thoughts. Uh, I'm going to fail this class if I don't pass this test, uh, or I'm going to draw, get you know, kicked out of college if I fail this class. Um, those kinds of, of um, negative thoughts, those nets, uh, generalized thinking, black and white thinking, those are all the different kinds of, of uh, things that will actually uh, exacerbate what is happening to you. Um, and I'm gonna actually jump a little bit ahead and show you this um, slide. And so what this slide represents is that notion that I was talking about earlier. Um, this represents the ABCs of, um, to me, it represents the ABCs of, of uh, how our, mind, bodies, uh, thoughts, and everything else uh, work. Uh, 
A, I know it says uh, emotion, thoughts, and behavior. A, to me, represents affect. Affects are emotions, right? So A is the emotion, B is behavior, and the C is cognition or thoughts. It's the cognitive triangle. So what this um, diagram or this image is showing is that every emotion that we have affects our behavior, affects our thoughts. Every thought that we have affects our behavior and affects our emotions and vice versa. Every behavior that we engage in affects the way we think and affects the way we feel, right? So this is part of that internal dialogue. This is part of that um, conversation that you need to have with yourself. Uh, again, not to, not to imply that this stress that you're feeling is completely in your head, but to say, how are you interacting with the stress that's real and how can you do um, something different with it? How can you interact with it in a better, healthier, more effective way? Um, are you behaving poorly, right? So in other words, uh, am I skipping meals and, uh, or eating junk food late into the night, causing me to have, um, you know, guilty sense of, okay, I shouldn't have eaten that and I'm trying to lose weight and here I go and eat a pizza. And now those feelings are, those thoughts are now triggering these emotions of saying, oh my God, I'm never gonna lose weight. I'm always gonna be fat. No one's gonna love me, right? It creates a very vicious cycle. And so you wanna be able to make sure that what you're engaging in is actually good, healthy choices given the circumstances that you're actually experiencing and exposed to. So when your thinking is off, those gnats, it's gonna affect your emotions and your behavior. When your emotions are off, right? When you're automatically saying, no one loves me, no one thinks I'm good enough, no one uh, wants to be with me, it's gonna start making you think poorly. It's gonna start making you isolate and behave poorly, right? So this triangle uh, is super important in being able to have um, sort of your um, ability to control or interact with that external stressor, all right? Watching your truths, your belief systems, your musts, your have tos, or I can'ts, or I shoulda, coulda, wouldas, um, those all fall into this line um, of, of thinking, right? I'm going to go back up and come back down to this last one, which is prioritizing your time and your tasks. Taking time out for yourself um, is super important, and that's um, just above that. And, and that goes back to uh, that bell curve that I was talking about in terms of uh, maximizing your performance. The more you are able to um, be on this side of that bell curve where you, that, that arousal level hasn't gotten overwhelming, you're going to continue to go up on your performance level. But once you start getting to the other side, you've got to take some time out. Now, the, this, this um, quote by Dwight D. Eisenhower is, uh, again, a favorite of mine. The most urgent decisions are rarely the most important ones, right? So what that means is that we tend to uh, feel the pressure and feel the time sensitivity for something, and that creates stress. But in reality, it probably wasn't all that important for us to, to deal with. So in brings this matrix, right? So in this uh, top left-hand corner, you're talking about things that are not urgent, but they might be important. And then in, next to it, are the things that are urgent and important. Um, down below, you're talking about things that are not urgent and not important. And then to the right side are the things that are urgent and important. So what does that mean? What does that look like? We're talking about, for example, exercising, studying, family time. It's important. It's important. They're not urgent. They're not an emergency. But they are actually very important. This, if we can spend a lot of our time in this square of what we're doing, we're actually doing a pretty, do, uh, pretty good job in uh, choosing healthy um, things for ourselves. The next line over is 
important and urgent, right? That's a deadline, it's a crisis, it's a problem that requires your immediate attention. It's a test that you've got to take tomorrow, uh, that you've got to pass. It's that presentation that you've got to uh, put together for uh, classmates. Um, so ideally, these tasks are things that you should be proactively eliminating in advance so that you can do more of things in box one, right? So even when they're urgent and important, chances are going to be that you knew they were coming. So the more you can proactively plan for them and eliminate them as you go through, the better you're gonna be able to, to deal with it. Okay, what falls into that not important and not urgent category? Wasting time uh, on activities, mindlessly browsing the web, uh, TikTok, social media, video games, TV. Minimizing these and using them as rewards for productive hours is actually what we should do. But what happens to us in, in severe stress situations is we say, you know what, I'm gonna go into uh, procrastination or avoidance mode, right? We talked about flight or flight. When we choose to flee or avoid the situation, we end up actually making our situations worse. So instead of you know, taking care of those uh, deadlines by proactively eliminating them, we say, you know what, I'll deal with it later. I'm going to go watch some TV or I'm going to play some video games. Um, and it ends up ruining our whole day, week or month. Um, so if we were able to use that and say, okay, well, I didn't do my task. I'm going to go ahead and spend 30 minutes watching TV, then that's, that's pretty uh, that would be pretty good. So the last category, urgent and not important. Typically urgent interruptions that don't help us achieve our goals are often confused with box two above. An example of this is a phone call, a text, or an email, right? It could be someone else's sense of urgency and they're blowing up your phone or they're blowing up your emails saying, I need this from you, I need this from you. But it's really you know, not an important thing. It's just their sense. Like they, maybe they need to know if you're coming to their birthday party next week. Well, that's next week and, and that's not a big deal and it's not really important. Right now you've got something else that you need to deal with, right? That unfortunately what happens is we, we take care of those urgent, unimportant things because it gives us a false sense that we're actually making progress on things. Uh, it gives us a sense of wanting to check things off of our list. But what we're left with are all of those things in that other box that really should have taken our time and we didn't put as much time into it. So being again careful, where are we putting our time and our effort? Is it into those things that are giving us a false sense of, um, hey, I, I accomplished something today? Or are you really accomplishing some things that are important and uh, necessary? Are you in the top half of that box or are you stuck down in the bottom? half of it. Again, how do you delegate? I mean, how do you deal with it? You delegate if you have um, uh, tasks that you can assign to other people, if it's a group, if it's a, a club, if it's an activity, you delegate it off, try and, and see if you can get some support in getting that task accomplished. Um, communication skills, believe it or not, and I'm sure it's not coming as a surprise to you, communication is super important. Having the ability to just simply say what you need, um, you know, is, is, sounds super easy, but it is very hard. Um, but you have to kind of take it like you're taking a flu shot and just kind of take a breath and say whatever it is, whether it's having a conversation about changing your majors with your parents or having to talk to them about having to stay an extra semester or a year or even moving schools altogether. Um, those are often very difficult conversations to have. Um, more often than not, though, your parents and your teachers and professors they're in this position because they want to see you succeed anyway. Um, they're not getting credit because they got you to graduate in four years. Your parents um, don't want you to graduate with something that you're not happy with or do something that you're not happy with. They want you to have that conversation about what is uh, stressing you out and why it's stressing you out. And they want to be able to have that opportunity to engage with you on that. When 
that isn't done, guess what? Your parents and other people around you are probably going to key in on all of those other uh, ways that your alarm bells are sounding. Remember the headaches and the and the disinterest and the fidgetiness and the anxiety and all those things. And you're going to say, no, 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 I'm fine. But what your your family, your friends, your your teachers, professors are all seeing is something's wrong. Something's wrong, and I wish I could help. I wish they would just open up and let me in. I wish I could help. Uh, uh, figure this out for them, right? Um, they know something's wrong, they just can't figure out what it is because you haven't uh, fully experienced, ex you know, brought them in on it. So work on that communication skill. Like I said, sometimes of uh, taking a deep breath and just letting it out and saying what you need to say, then, then that's how you do it. Um, that black and white thinking of saying, oh, if I tell my parents I'm not gonna graduate this semester, they're gonna, this um, chances are going to be unlikely, um, unless you've already had that conversation, um, which then you already sort of uh, knew where this was going, right? Um, that last bullet on there, it says avoid communication overload. So that's something that's very difficult in today's society. Um, we have, especially now with COVID, um, you know, we've become this con constantly uh, engaged in, in technology uh, community. We are constantly on social media, uh, Zoom calls like this. Uh, we're just, uh, our interactions uh, become this style of interaction. So a lot of times, like for me, I'm struggling uh, even giving this lecture because I feed off of uh, uh, the facial expressions and the eye contact that I can make and I can't see any of you. Uh, so this is really difficult. And, and so this is the opposite of communication overload in the sense that I'm not getting any communication um, from what I need to be able to uh, interpret and understand and, and navigate what I'm going to do next. I, I'm kind of flying solo uh, and trying to figure this out. So it's a, it's a slippery slope and it's a, it's a very, um, uh, sharp edge that we live on, right? On, on the one side of that knife is the sense of never being able to get out of touch uh, with anything, right? That sentence is never being out of touch means never being able to get away. Um, so needing to put that away and just saying, okay, I'm, I'm off. Um, you know, I, I've definitely done that on, on several occasions. Typically, it's, it's with a vacation. Um, so I'll just put my phone down and say, you know, that's it. I'm not, I'm not going to be here. And uh, my parents and sisters and brothers that need to get a hold of me know where, that, where I am and they can if there's an emergency. Otherwise, everyone knows to, to, to stay away uh, once I declare, you know, a technology holiday. Um, so don't be afraid to do those kinds of things uh, to give yourself some, some uh, respite from all of this. Uh, avoiding avoidance. Um, again, eliminating the things that you should be um, preparing yourself in advance to do is another super uh, important way of being able to um, mitigate that stress. The last two on here, relaxation strategies, yoga, stretching, meditation, humor, and laughing. You would be shocked at what the research shows in terms of the amount of endorphins that are pumped into your body simply by doing things like deep breathing, stretching, and laughing. Uh, where I'm from in India, they have uh, this thing called laughing club. So what that literally is, is uh, it's typically in the older generation, but um, groups of people will get together in a neighboring park um, or green space in the morning, 7, 7, 30, 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and instead of doing stretching and yoga, you'll have a leader and he or she will uh, guide you through laughing. And I've actually done it in person uh, like that once. And it was the funniest thing I've ever experienced in my life because by the end of it, my cheeks were hurting from laughing so hard. And after 20 minutes of doing this, I literally felt like I ran five miles. 
Uh, I had plenty of energy for the rest of my entire day. And this was years ago. And to this day, when I think of that moment, I get a smile on my face because it was such an experience of having that rush of great, great chemicals going through you. And even though it was forced laughter in the beginning, what ends up happening is that forced laughter creates a sense of wanting to giggle at that and that giggling is true laughter because you're laughing at yourself laughing you know on purpose and it just creates a um you know that a good vicious cycle of of laughter hormones um yoga and stretching uh and deep breathing you know that deep breathing exercise literally can be done in less than two minutes sitting at your desk and no one even needs to know that you've done anything. But closing your eyes, taking a deep breath in with your nose, closing your eyes, and then deep breathing, exhaling through your mouth. You can do that three times. You know, pause for, if it, can't, it takes you five seconds to breathe in, pause and then breathe out for five seconds. And just doing that will lower your blood pressure, will increase your sense of, okay, I can, I can reset, right? So being able to reset and finding ways to reset is uh, really, really, really important in, throughout all of this. Um, you know, and the last thing that I wanna kind of talk about is, is what are some of the myths uh, about stress? Um, the, some of the, the obvious things are that stress is the same for everyone. No, not everyone's going to react to stress the same way. Each of you are going to have your own individual way of experiencing it and dealing with it. Um, and it's going to be up to you to identify what those triggers are. Um, what is the environmental or the external uh, trigger of that stress? What is the internal trigger of that stress? And then what are you going to be able to do with it, whether it's um, from your thoughts, from your emotions, or from your behavior. Uh, what are you gonna actually do about whatever you're experiencing so that you can reduce that stress uh, experience for yourself? Remember, the notion that stress is bad is actually a myth. We need stress. We need a certain amount of stress in our life for our um, motivation to kick in, for our sense of urgency and drive, all of those things. When there's no stress and there's no um, uh, push behind us, that drive isn't going to be there, right? So we really do need it. The problem becomes when that stress engages our fight or flight system. And that's when it starts, that means that we haven't done enough of a good job at mitigating that stress. And we've actually allowed uh, that fight or flee um, thought to come in like do i am i going to just you know take my gloves off and and go uh, bare bones or am i going to just run away from it or could i have done things before i got to this place to to mitigate it stress is everywhere so you have to live with it sure but you can also shape your life in such a way that you can create stress-free uh time uh during um during those moments when you're trying to manage it as best as you can um, let's see, uh, no symptoms, no stress, right? Well, what we also know is that chronic stress, right, over time will eventually cause your mind and body to wear out. And so we may become tolerant of a certain amount of stress and all of a sudden, uh, what we think we can handle, we've just now raised that bar to here. We've not done anything to reduce the stress. We've just raised our ability to tolerate the stress. Well, over time, allowing ourselves to just be exposed to that chronic level of stress has that wear and tear um, uh, impact on our bodies. And, you know, as I mentioned before, on disease states. Um, and then the, the, the last one, only major symptoms require attention. Remember what I said that it's not just about when that fight or flight system is kicked in, uh, that you're supposed to do something about it. You're supposed to do something about it the moment you start to feel like, okay, I'm not quite feeling right. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm twisting my hair. I'm uh, restless. I'm not able to concentrate. I'm, I'm falling asleep. Whatever that is, 
those are things, those are ways your body is trying to let you know, hey, on the inside, I'm not feeling so good. It might not be all the way to the outside yet, but the body is sending you messages that on the inside, it's not feeling so good. So don't wait until major symptoms have come along. Try and take care of them uh, you know, prior to. Beyond that, I don't have anything more and I'm hoping for some questions or thoughts or comments or anything. All right, so uh, if you have any questions, um, you can go ahead and either put them in the chat or maybe even better, if you wanna use the raise hand feature and then I can call on you and uh, you can ask our speaker anything you'd like. Uh, and we did have some comments as, as you were talking that uh, they, they appreciated your laughter story, especially <laughs> about how it really is the best medicine. And uh, I think that that's, uh, that definitely can be the case. I, I've, I've definitely experienced myself. Looks like we have some questions. How do we differentiate between having anxiety or just general stress? That's something we should see a professional about to discuss. So when do you when do you start uh, you know to to decide this is something that you need some help in in uh, managing? Um, at any point you can ask for help, right? So the the point that that this last uh, statement that I made that only major symptoms require attention is um, is the myth. Um, minor symptoms require attention. Um, any symptoms require attention, and that attention can be gotten. Um, from within ourselves, from uh, within us to a friend, uh, or it can be a professional. So at whatever point you feel like it's time to go ahead and just have a conversation with someone uh, is the right time to do it. Um, now, I don't know if that makes sense in the sense that, you know, I think the notion of going to see someone professionally may have a bit of a stigma associated with it that, oh my God, she's having to go or he's having to go see a doctor or a therapist and you know, he must be really freaking out. Um, and I think unfortunately that's, that's the, the myth as well. It's trying to make sure that you don't freak out, right? That's the whole point of all of this is to make sure you're not falling apart uh, and getting into someone before you get there is the only way that you're going not going to fall apart. I hope that makes sense. All right. Now we had uh, some other questions. I think the next one was, uh, what are good ways to communicate to others that you're feeling stressed or to help others when they are, when they communicate that they're stressed? So, um, you know, I mean, in terms of being able to say I'm, I'm stressed, I think just by being able to say that is, is a good start. Um, to say, hey, you know, uh, I'm not handling this all that well, or, um, you know, gosh, I wish this wasn't, you know, the way it was gonna be, or in, in, in some way or shape or form, letting the other individual know um, that you're not happy with the way things are going right now is a good way to get the conversation started because that gives them an option, an opportunity to say, well, what do you mean? Or why do you think it's not going right? Or, you know, uh, how do you think it could go better? Um, that's that's the, the, any chance for someone else to be able to start that conversation um, or for you to start that conversation is, is anything really. In terms of what to say to someone that has reached out to you, a lot of it is going to be initially is going to simply be reflecting. Um, reflect to them that you hear the stress that they're experiencing, um, you know, that you feel um, uh, that you hear them say, you know, gosh, uh, I, I'm really sorry that I hear you saying that you're really stressed out and that this is really tough and it must be really difficult, you know. Uh, um, is it is this affecting you in any way? Like, you know, or, uh, do you have a hard time sleeping or anything like that? You know, so just ask them in terms of general questions about how they're feeling so that they're getting an opportunity to feel like you're empathizing with them, sympathizing with them. In a lot of times, it's going to be simply that someone else is hearing them, um, that their uh, sense of feeling of uh, anxiety or stress is 
at least shared and reflected um, to say that, yeah, I feel that way too. Um, mirroring it for them is, is just a really good way of being able to resolve uh, at least a sense that they've got it off their shoulders. Great. Um, let's see, uh, another question. What are some strategies you recommend to cope with the stress of finals? Stress of finals, absolutely. Um, so, you know, having your um, uh, schedule for when you're going to study and how you're going to study what, you know, making a schedule in advance of what your content you're going to master by certain days is, is going to be important. Beyond those obvious uh, strategies, I think it's going to be super important for you to put in reward moments too. Um, remember what I was talking about, those unimportant um, activities. Build that into your time um, and say, you know, for every hour that you sit and study uh, without interruption, uh, you get to take, you know, five minutes and, and go get a cookie or go get a walk or uh, spend five minutes on TikTok or, or whatever it is that you would like to do. But it, it gives you that opportunity to do something different. Putting your brain somewhere else for a little bit and allowing the parts of the brain that you've just exercised to sort of have a um, relief moment is super important. For those of you that do exercise, you can, you, you can um, think about it this way. Like if you have um, uh, a, a circuit training or things that you're doing, you need that one minute of recovery in between each set. And you get that set done, you take that one minute of recovery, and then, because at the end of that one set, you're probably, your muscles are screaming at you, your body's screaming at you. You take that one minute recovery, you take a couple of deep breaths, water, and then guess what? You get back in and you're doing the next, you know, 15 rep, and, you know, by the 15th, you're screaming again, but you just got in. And then, you know, again, a one minute recovery, and guess what? You're gonna do your third set, right? So this is what I'm talking about when I was talking about being able to reset at the top of that, at the top of that bell curve so that you kind of reset and say, okay, I'm gonna take a recovery, I'm gonna do something to get myself back on this side so that I can push again and get back up. It's no different in the same sense of, of that circuit training. Um, you do your first rep, uh, 15, your, your your body's screaming, your arms are screaming, whatever it is that you're doing, you take a one minute recovery and then you're able to do it again. So that same concept works when it comes to studying. Do whatever it is that you have to, but then ensure that you've put a one minute recovery uh, or something equivalent of that nature uh, so that your brain can reset. And I think we have one more question. Um, how hard is it to overcome a nervous habit such as biting nails? I'd like to hear this one too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so nervous habits um, and things are another example of those mats, right? It's a negative automatic in this situation. It's a behavior. It's, it's happened so quickly that a lot of times people realize that it's happening. Um, so when it comes to those kinds of behavioral modifications, this is what we're talking about, um, it requires behavioral interventions. Um, so the moment you're aware of you doing that, of biting your nails, do something different, right? With your hands, um, snapping a rubber band. Usually, uh, again, what's called negative reinforcement is another behavioral modification method. So uh, a rubber band is, is one way. When, uh, when uh, kids are little, or back in my day when I was growing up, uh, they used to talk about putting you know, hot sauce or something on your nails so that you didn't bite them. Um, so that you, know, you, you put that on there and if you're you know, uh, super intolerant of spicy food, boy, that's one sure why, fire way of making sure you don't bite your fingers. You wanna make sure you don't rub your eyes either. Um, but behavioral uh, automatic um, uh, actions require behavioral modification. Um, you know, and then with it also paired with, why am I doing this? What is happening that I'm biting my nails? Is it because I'm stressed? Am I experiencing something that I could maybe engage in 
uh, that mental break for a minute, that mental recovery for one minute, instead of biting your nails, you go into a mental recovery. So it's going to be a combination of uh, some sort of a behavioral modification, whether it's uh, you know uh, snapping a rubber band, uh, sitting on your hands, uh, standing up and and you know pulling putting your hands down by your side, something to immediately stop the behavior, and then going back and saying, okay, what's happening that I'm engaged in this behavior, uh, this negative tick, uh, you know, or, or negative um, behavior that's, that's, that's going on. So then start to pay attention to what are those triggers? Is it an internal trigger? Is it an external trigger? And start to pay attention to that. See if you can identify uh, red flags that might be, you know, coming. It might be that you're hungry. Uh, you don't even realize it that, oh my gosh, every time I get hungry, I start to bite my nails. Maybe that's the correlation. Maybe it's a combination of things, but you have to start paying attention to your environment outside and internally in terms of what might be going on. Remember that, that ABC triangle that I talked about. A is emotion, B is behavior, and um, the C is cognition. Right? So each of those things are completely uh, interacting with each other. Uh, that's this, this um, um, graphic. So when each of those things interact, so when you're engaged in a behavior like biting nails, again, remember, it's going to have a thought associated with it. It's going to have an emotion associated with it. The key is to try and figure out what are those thoughts, what are those emotions, and then seeing if you can stop that behavior. We're talking about um, painting your nails in the chat here. Uh, a couple of people mentioned that that might be a good option, uh, including transparent mint nail polish. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very good. I think that's all the questions. Uh, and I think we're about out of time as well. Um, but um, if anyone has any other questions, is there any way they can um, send those to you or anything of that nature or uh, what would be? Yeah, best? absolutely. If you, if they need to uh, reach out to me, you can give them my contact information. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, if you do have any questions, you can just email me and then I can send that to you. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much, Bina. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I put the, the survey again in the chat. So if you fill that out before you go, that would be great. And uh, we should be getting this up onto the website the next week or two. Um, so if you want to watch it back again, then uh, it should be there. So uh, again, thank you all for coming. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Ray. Thank you.